What's up, everyone? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long. Today, I'm here with Brian Lee. Uh, Brian Lee, as everyone knows, is a, or a lot of people know, is a former pro gamer turned trader. Um, he's got a lot of great content out there. He's always, he, you know, he's he likes to share his knowledge and it, be part of the community, which is great. Like, he's been on the Steady Trade podcast. He's been on Chat with Traders. Um, you name it. He's always been out there willing to share what he knows and just he's really, really a, a big figure in the community and bringing every the whole community forward as far as information and knowledge and being a, a guest like on like today on the Friendly Bear podcast. So um, with that being said, what's up, Brian? How's it going? Hey, it's going uh, well. I mean, this year for me has been sort of so-so, but um you know, I think that it's a, been like a huge learning experience and it's something that I want to talk to and just make sure everyone understands, like not everybody who they perceive or like idolize or look to up to, um, is always killing it. And I think I, I have a responsibility to like share that with people. So I think this is a good opportunity to do that. Sounds good. Yeah. Because, um, a lot of, you know, this this market has been a lot different from the past couple of years, you know, uh, 2020, 2021. Um, I know I was in the Ducks conference uh, a week and a half ago, and he was mentioning, or I think he just posted, made a post this week saying that we're back to 2019 levels as far as volume. And, um, and that's, I think that's a major part of it, you know, uh, of, of things changing for a lot of traders that had a lot of success. I, I know um, I was, I had some good success, but like a lot of traders have an, an extraordinary amount of success in the past couple of years. And then now that way of trading has, has changed. So like now we're, we're kind of having to adapt to pre-pandemic uh, trading. Is that like what you're thinking when you're going about like adapting? Are you, are you um, looking to the past and seeing because you've been trading for a while. Are you using the past, like, as a, you know, as an, are you trying to figure it out, like, by going, to, looking deep into the, like, before the pandemic? Right. So when you mentioned that you wanted to kind of touch on this point, I went back and I looked at kind of my records, like, pre-2020. So I, I had a charts from 2017, 18, and 19, and I was trying to compare the volume and, like, how the charts are reacting. And uh, I feel like I had a misrecollection. Um, my initial gut instinct was like, oh, it is better now. Like we we were at a lower level of volume prior. And I felt like in 2021 and 20, the volume went insane. And then like, now we kind of fell somewhere in the middle, but actually it is very, very similar. I'm just looking at like the opening volume, which is probably like the most important, just a couple hundred thousand, not really seeing those two, three million volume candles, things like that very often. So yeah, it is very similar to the past. I would say in general, as a trader, um, I like to kind of use a little bit of recency and how I analyze the market. So I'm looking back maybe two, three months on a rolling basis to kind of figure out what's working, what's not, and what kind of like environment we are in currently. And so I never actually took the time to go back all the way and check those patterns out. But I will say that those times I felt maybe because a lot of traders and myself included were a lot newer, we didn't really feel the effects as much as now we're today. A lot of us consider ourselves like professional traders and not kind of in that novice stage. So we're noticing the volume in a bigger way. And I feel like probably the biggest difference though, I would, I, I would say is that, um, back then you had like very pronounced trends. So it's like, we're either going to get a downtrend and it's going to sustain that, or we're going to get an uptrend and, you know, it's just going to hold all day. And no matter how much risk you apply, you're just going to keep losing over and over again, which is why it was always important to have a max loss. But um, these days I feel like because of the success of 2020 and 2021, a lot of traders have way more capital to work with and they're much more sophisticated. And then there's also more uh, algorithms, it feels like, which makes, you know, you have these downtrends and like a couple short sellers, or even one short seller has happened to me in the past where I was sizing kind of like how I was in 21 on a 
22 play and then when it's time to cover and liquidity dries up like you want to cover your position you might spike the stock up like 50 percent of what it faded so um knowing as a single trader that i can make that happen i can only imagine traders who outperform me or even just like a accumulation of traders which it seems like there's a lot more um but in general like with with that there's a lot of disruption to trends so like if, it, if we're in a downtrend it's super easy for it to start reversing right away or for like an algorithm to just support the bid and hold it sideways for the rest of the day i think one of the main things i noticed was that um intraday you're not seeing a lot of really strong pullbacks uh, for like mean reversion trading you're seeing those moves happen on like extremely low volume over the next two three days just you know you have to kind of swing that and just hope that there's liquidity to get out the next day or um you know sometimes those stocks just hold and you see a lot more multi-day runs where they pick up and after a base they eventually kind of break the high and then it's anyone's game from there so it's like it's a lot more tricky these days i would say but not entirely unlike back then just with a couple different factors man uh interesting points um that what came to mind right away when you mentioned that towards the last half of, of what you were saying i interviewed uh karan khana uh a week ago or so a week and a half ago i don't know if you've, you've seen that podcast oh, yeah. but but he was mentioning how he was collecting data and trying to figure out he's one of the traders that's trying to figure out what's going on just like we all are um that had success before and like this year uh trying to figure it out so he was saying one observation he had was um that when there will be like a first green day and it will have a ton of volume one day in this market and then like that volume doesn't sell off into the next few days it's just like you have that one green candle that probably was ignited through a lot of algo driven volume and then it doesn't bleed out or rather in the in the past that you would see that big green candle on day one and then those people it would be bag holders in there and they would sell as it as it it, it fades off um what what are your thoughts on that as far as uh this market's volume because we still get those day one volume days where it'll it might you know go over 100 million volume but then the next couple of days it's just like it's completely dried out What's your, any yeah. observations with that? Yeah, that, I mean, that is like one of the things I was really kind of mind blown by when I was looking at it. I was just like, how can something have hundreds of millions of volume and it'll die off slowly over the next couple of days with opens that are like 15,000 volume. And to me, I feel like it goes counter to what I believe, like similar to what you mentioned about the back holders. I feel like it, it's either that when it's being accumulated by whatever, you know, whoever wants to accumulate it with the algorithm, um, they're actually intending to bring this higher. So for them, it's not like, you know, people buy and like first and foremost, people buy because they believe it'll go higher. And so it might be that they, they just decided that's the day that they're going to start generating the volume and buy. And then they have a, plan for it in the future that we're not aware of. Um, the other factor is that I noticed like 2020, 21, uh, you know, with the whole meme culture and everything like that, it became more and more popular to just hold on, hold on, you know, huddle. And so, you know, despite the fact that people like to claim that, you know, in the past two years that it was easier, I feel like it actually also was hard to be assured as well, because you had a lot of these moves where typically in the past, if there was like a bunch of volume on an overextended stock, the back holders would sell. But in those uh, situations, it was not uncommon to see a stock pull back like heavy crash, but no sellers. Like even the retail wasn't afraid. So they became rewarded in the sense that like over the next couple of days, even if they tanked a huge loss and they sustained it for a while, a lot of times it would come right back. So I think it did generate a bunch of overconfidence like on the retail side, but also we're, I'm not really entirely sure what the, um, you know, the bigger players intend to do with the stock, but all I know is that, yeah, it's just, you're seeing a lot more of these moves transpire over a couple of days with really low volume. And one of the things that was really confusing for me was that 
in terms of scale, I was thinking like, you know, how, why should I trade that now? Even, despite the fact that I see it happening, why should I trade this pattern now when I believe that, you know, in the, in the past, like, like when I was much, I had, well, first of all, I sized down quite a bit during this year, just to, because liquidity was like really poor, but in the past, if I was looking at these numbers, I would say to myself, like, it's not even worth it because I don't even think I can get out. And the the risk of overnight is also kind of big. So I was thinking that for the long term, it's not even really worth it to practice this. Um, this even though it seems to be like the main way to make money with these patterns, because like you can see some pretty dramatic moves overnight. Sometimes you see offerings too, or, or just uh, some random news, or they just let go all of a sudden. And technically, you could make a lot of money, but when I see that, when I see people claiming that's kind of their bread and butter, um, I also wonder, like, you know, there's kind of a size constraint. So it's to me, it's like uh, you also have to think past that as well um, if you want to be at the next level. Um, great. So one of the points you meant you mentioned um, about the retail traders last last couple of years. Uh, the behavior, right? The meme, meme stock, Reddit, all these guys, the the YOLO guys, whatever you want to call them, the retards, the, I don't know, the apes. Um, yeah. So so they kind of like uh, just kept, I, re I remember this. It was very annoying. Like when I got caught in a short, it was it was a bad situation or any any short. Okay, it's, it's good. It's cool. You made a lot of money. But like when you get caught in a squeeze, it's, uh, it's, it's really frustrating because like it's these apes. And if you're going through Twitter, like I, I, I watch the Twitter, you see them like piling in with the emojis and it's just craziness or it was. And so you're saying like they like they will just dip by and dip by and dip by and hodl. And and then you're saying that even now that um that market scenario is done, we're not getting any more stimulus checks. People aren't inside like it, it's not like before that behavior is kind of like been ingrained in them. So, so it's going to take a while for them to really for that. For, for like reality to kick in as far as that be to change the behavior because the behavior is we, we're still seeing the behavior carry over is that what you're what you mean yes i think i think that's pretty much taken over the way people think about trading and unless they actually have kind of the drive to pursue trading in a serious way and learn about how to manage risk and why these aren't Good ways to trade i don't think that culturally people will change their behavior because it's just it just took over you know it was a it was a phenomenon everybody was in on it you know my barber was in on it like everybody is having the same idea about how to trade and so like there's just a if you think about it there's only a very small percentage of us who actually think about trading in a professional way and like actually don't view it kind of like it was a casino or just a yolo gamble so in that way, like, even if there are a bunch of buyers that are being enticed in the in the past, those buyers would sell off slowly, but now they're just, you know, they kind of view it as just play money or something like that. And um, I think even then, the majority of people who even want to take trading somewhat seriously also kind of are in the crypto space too. So we we don't really have those bag holders in a sense, like as much as we did in the past. And I think a lot of people were jaded towards the market and went over to crypto, like within those last two years, as a result of just the whole collapse and feeling, you know, kind of distraught about their GME and AMC hype. And like, you know, when you, when you have this crypto market, that's somewhat unregulated and there's so many scams and stuff like that, it's about, it's basically the same thing as penny stocks, but, um, you know, the moves are crazy and they happen quite frequently and everyone's kind of shifted the area. So I think that the market may never really be the same, uh, for us in the equity side, but at the same time, it's still, there's still plenty of opportunities and I don't think it's worse necessarily than it was in the past. It's a little bit better than 20, 2019 and before with the volume, but like, it's weird because you'll see hundred million volume, but it's the stock can go neither up nor down. It will just 
go sideways and you're like, what, what is actually happening here? It's obviously something, some algorithms just turning volume in, you know, it's a, it is kind of confusing to navigate because you have no idea, like what is the intent of the stock and you can't rely on behavior. Like just one really classic example is, um, we all know like VWA Boulevard and stuff like that. And so you're, you know, we're having stock spike into hundred million volume candle you, you, right at the VWAP. Nowadays, you'll see stocks just run through. They'll just rip through that. If they can rip it through pre-market, sometimes it will just go in, insanely high. And even during the market hours, like there was a stock, I think it was, a, I think it was TBLT this week where it was a perfect example where it was, it was spiking intraday through that VWAP level. And all you saw was just this huge parabolic out of that which was mostly shorts covering. And then after like a dollar over that level, which is like not normal, it starts slowly fading off. And then you just, it just comes back to where it came from. So it's like, you can't really rely on these metrics anymore. It's a lot of times, like I, I saw the, um, the one with Reed, the, the clip about Reed with the Misfit, Misfits Happy Hour. And you oh, mentioned yeah. something about like, Sharks versus sharks. I do feel like that is part of it as well because the, you know, the short sellers who became much more sophisticated or increased their bankroll, they kind of like, we're all kind of cannibalizing each other in a way. And it feels like most of the participants do tend to be on the short side in this market. So it's like everyone has their own way of attacking things. Like some people will wait for the breakouts and then some people will just trade normally and set their risk at, you know, the obvious levels and, you know, everyone has their own game plan, but at the end of the day, we all, we all have to cover. So when it comes to end of day, people are covering, causing these spikes, or when it breaks over these resistance levels, people are covering. And I would imagine like, there's also a lot of people who, even within our small niche of short sellers, they're like not really managing risk either. So instead of like cutting it where they should, um, they'll let it spike and then pull back. And then that's, that's the level where most people get in trouble with, and especially people who blow up their accounts is they, they have this internal dialogue of like, do I cover here? Like, that's where I should have covered, but now, oh, it's coming back. Maybe that was fake. And I imagine like, if, if, there, if I was in that position and I was caught like at my peak, you know, you can kind of create a floor and then there's only one way for it to go up because every little movement, every little uptick from that point makes you more and more nervous. And then you get that further spike, but at that point, there's no more buyers and it. And it's just like, I don't think those are retails. I think a lot of that is just short sellers covering. So it's, it's really interesting because I noticed that, well, I happen to know that a lot of like prop traders, for example, um, a lot of People actually ended up quitting this year, getting blown out, giving up. Um, it's not really that reported, but it's it's really not common to see that. And so, typically in the past, you know, you have like a you have kind of like a bearish market, you have a bullish market, and like when shorts are so confident they keep getting blown out, like then you start seeing more normal moves where people are not like covering, covering, covering over each other. But despite the fact that we've seen a lot of short sellers exit the game. We still have those situations. So I think like there are still some bigger short sellers who are yet to have bled out completely. And maybe that's because they know how to manage risk a little bit better or that they just made a bunch of money. And I don't know, like, I'm, I'm not sure what will remedy that, but it's just been like a sustained period for many months where this kind of behavior is occurring. And so it's very, um, for me, like I've had to realize like this is kind of the new norm and the only indication that it may change would be like, if economically, I feel like we're not in this kind of bear market. I mean, it's not like no one's saying it's officially a recession or anything like that, but it's, I think it's most obvious and common sense to people feeling that it is kind of a bear market. And so, um, until it's until it's very obviously bullish on the overall market, I feel like this is what we might have to deal with for 
however many months or even years who knows so i see so the market is essentially is overcrowded with shorts and you got a lot of traders now with bigger bank rolls that that are more short so um what comes to mind is just like a couple of days ago this past week hkd any any thoughts on that since it's like fresh in everyone's head heads <laughs> yeah hkd is just something i would not even trade or look at i i, I was <laughs> looking at it and you know naturally you're it's gonna come to your attention and i'm like oh maybe this is the top and i saw that nice that nice crash where it halted down and that was, that was looking very similar to a lot of the situations in the past like the one where ducks just made millions of dollars on you know and i was like dang you know that maybe i should have played that but in the end it, it all comes down kind of to that volume and i was looking at it and it's like it's grinding up on such low volume i mean i know it's almost 500 bucks now but it's not really it looks like so illiquid and not only that but it's exploding so for me, it's just kind of like a no touch. And I've, yeah. I've learned over time, I've learned really to pay attention to the volume and how it relates to the, the price. Because like when you're thinking about building positions, um, you really have to think about like the worst case scenario. And if, if it starts to go against you with that kind of volume, like, I mean, I, I imagine it's, it was halting and things like that. So to me, that's a situation I just don't want to be involved with. I hope that it brings kind of hype to the to the market, which is always good. We yeah. like to see hype, but like at the same time, there was hype with uh, like in March, there was a lot of hype and that caught me off guard as well. So I don't, I'm not even sure if I really like sectors but hkd seems completely independent from like yeah i don't know if it's monkeypox or what it's nothing like that right no so no it's just a, a, it's a just recent, completely random like a, a, Ch a china ipo from the cayman islands uh i think the ipo price was like 680 or seven bucks and everybody <laughs> everything so everybody sees it as a short so like like <laughs> the, the and, and like people are like oh it's salivating to short this and then more so short sellers and i know a few short sellers big short sellers that got caught in this like mm. tremendously big short sellers so if they're getting caught in this and they're like the whales imagine everybody and then all these other smaller guys getting caught in this you know so like the market is way oversaturated with shorts like this was a pump and dump to begin with but it became a, a monstrosity because like there's so many short sellers that see it for what it is and now they're they're killing each other <laughs> it's, it's so, i think the, the the easiest thing to look at is just like look how crazy gme went and how it just held on for dear life for like years, yeah oh you know? my like, god yeah like obviously it's a short but if again if people if people are willing to just keep supporting the bid and just not let it go and if shorts are willing to keep shorting things and keep ripping it up i mean that should have came back for sure so the fact that that it keeps basing same thing with i mean amc kind of broke down but the, the fact that gme is still up there is like that's just the new the new way of things so you can't look at something that's 500 bucks and think it's going to be a dollar um yeah. unless like you see that unless you pick your spot you know like if if you said oh it's 250 is like a nice number i'm just going to randomly start shorting it here with a wider risk and then it holds down and you cover there then yeah sure but when in terms of it's like grinding 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 after that happened you it's very very scary and you have to kind of like you kind of have to look for that quick move i think that 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 hold down move and if you don't get that then you you just have to get out like there's no like there's no conviction on this thing where you just hold on to it because you have no idea how high it can go now yeah exactly and those halt downs this one's halted down and this will give it they give out the shorts opportunity to get out but a lot of shorts they get they're greedy and they want they want five bucks you know they <laughs> And because these things have flushed down, I don't know if you've seen that uh, there's been some good traders that have made a lot of money from these recently. These things that go from like a hundred dollars oh, yeah. to, to $5. So everybody sees, thinks of that. And then like, this one's not doing that. But um, so with, with that, so that's, that's an independent thing. So thanks for breaking that down. Those are really good thoughts on that. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people interested of uh, Brian Lee's thoughts in that. Cause like, this is like uh, the popular 
stock everyone's talking about that I right now. But yeah. uh, with that, okay, so I know you're big on mindset, and uh, and you know I I I think you're working with Kim on some things. I've you've, you've mentioned it in the past, or Kim's mentioned it. Uh, I know Kim definitely has not mentioned. It. I think you mentioned it. Um, so so what, what so what do you think traders can improve on to like when you encounter traders like newer traders especially and they're coming to you or they're asking questions um what do you think is a common trait that they can all work on right away like what do you see or like what what have you what what are what have you done for yourself to improve your trading dramatically you know like that is like outside of trading you know what i'm saying hmm. i think you know obviously the the environment hasn't been great so it's kind of it's very difficult to be like, oh, I'm constantly improving and feel that as a trader when I'm just like sizing down simultaneously. But I feel that the lessons here are a lot deeper than just like seeing your equity curve go up and being parabolic and like that. Cause that's, that's really obvious to measure progress. For me, um, a lot of the things that I would tell people really depends on what stage of the journey they are. So for example, like, if you're a newer trader, you really have to obsessively put in as much time as like humanly possible, right? You have to, you do have to burn the midnight oil and push yourself because you have a lot of ground to cover. And I don't think that you need to necessarily think about like how long it's going to take, but rather like consistently put in an effort in an efficient way. Like don't, you don't want to waste your time with, um, with testing ideas that you can't, well, you, I, what I'm saying is you basically want to do review that is tried and true in terms of like recording either with footage or with recording, you know, screenshots and looking back in the past. Cause if you're doing this, you can actually, you know, on the weekends, you, by looking towards the past, you can gain experience, you know, in real time by testing your ideas that you have. Like if you have an idea of this might be a setup or whatever, and you look back, like you have three months of data. That's a really good way to start verifying if your methodology is, is correct or if it has a good win rate or if it has, you know, any merit whatsoever, right? That's, that's all good stuff. I would say less of like, you don't need to really consume that much trading content because a lot of traders are saying kind of the same thing. Um, but in terms of if you're like, more experience as a trader, I think like it's actually paradoxical, but I, cause, but I feel that taking time off is more beneficial for you because like you hear a lot of times people say, um, you know, putting your wrist on the best setups and things like that. And for me, I used to get, well, I still do like ha have people misunderstand my position on this because like I say risk is a certain percentage of your account, things like that. But like when I was trading at my peak, uh, I couldn't trade setups based like based on volume alone. So that inherently I'm trading only the best setups. It's more of like, I was only willing to put risk on the setups that are even tradable, which means they are the best setups. And so it's, it's just the flip side of the coin. It's either you, you know, some people they're like, I'm going to just trade every day, trade every day. And then I'm going to put a bunch of risk on like something that has high odds for them. But Personally, for me, like, I don't even know what has high odds for me. I kind of view everything as just a, just a probability. And so like, if I can put the risk on, then it's worth to trade for me. That, that's just a simple fact. But I, with Kim, like I've been working on just taking time off, especially during this year. And that actually helps you, it helps you see a little bit more clear, like when the market is conducive for your style or not like i think in 21 20 and 2020 it was like oh trade every single day trade every single day you can't miss a day because if you miss a day then you, you know you're going to miss out on x opportunity but uh, as you get bigger there's less and less opportunities that fits your criteria that you can trade so you have to actually learn like how to take time off and there's there's like some interesting stats i gained from this year which is that um I looked and I recorded 
three years of data in the last year, if I didn't even show up on Mondays at all, I would have made more money, which is actually crazy because I always believed that I had to trade every single day. But I feel that if you, if you understand, like you can be a lot more patient with yourself, take time off when the days that have the most impact that you're trading on, um, come, you'll be more focused. You'll be able to take advantage of those. And I've seen that, like the behavior that I had to implement as a beginner, which was like study focus all every day, every, you know, every weekend, all the amount of time you have. When I, when I saw myself doing that as a more experienced trader, I realized that I wasn't able to produce as much, uh, meaningful, like kind of work, for example, like going back and recording and checking all of my weeks, days of the week and figuring out that Monday was not even profitable for me. That's a project that I wouldn't have had enough like mental energy to do if I was on the grind and hustle every single day. So by taking time off, you're able to kind of like realize how much more energy you have as an individual and that translates into the market. So probably the biggest thing for me this year was to take time off. I, like in the past, I only took the days I need to take off, but this year I've been taking off multiple days of the week. And I think that's the right thing to do, especially in this market, because like, I think it'll be pretty clear when things are better, but for the moment, um, this is the time to kind of just relax. And so I know it's not the answer like a lot of people want to hear, but I find that being able to take time off from the market actually benefits you a lot um, when you're like confident in your own abilities. If, if you're not there yet, then you have to grind, of course. Interesting. So like, you know, so for the more uh, experienced trader, like that's, that's having a frustrating time in the markets, like instead of grinding through just uh focus, you know, I know it's hard. I know like for me, for example, um, there was a period of a couple of weeks. I was like, uh, I was uh, in over my head and I went uh, on a trip to Thailand and, and Dubai. And, uh, it, it, you know, when I'm traveling, I, I, I made a point last year just not to trade while traveling because I've had big losses in the past while traveling. So I forced myself not to, but it's really hard to take time off. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you really want to get in there. You might see a trade. You might have a, a a friend of yours, a buddy of yours, that's like bringing a sock to your attention, and it's tough, you know. Um, but yeah, and also another thing, so it's 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 tough. You almost got to force yourself not to trade, uh, and take force yourself to take time off. Like close the the computer. Don't don't do it. You know, go somewhere else. Travel. Go to the jungle or something. You know that. I mean, uh, in my case at least, but um. But also, like I've I've had from my experience, I've noticed for a few years, not this year, but like I always sucked on Fridays, for example, or Tuesdays or in the past or something. And instead of trying to understand why, just take those days off and you'll save a lot of money. And then like, you know what I'm saying? Because like, I, so what, what do you think of that? Like, let's say Mondays, because, um, you know, as, as traders that like that we we adapt we're always looking to solve this problem. Like why, why do I suck on Mondays or why do I suck on Fridays and digging into the da data and all that, and then trading and then getting yourself in a hole, a deeper hole. You're like, damn, I knew I shouldn't have traded today. Um, I, the stats told me not to trade today. And I traded and I just lost a few grand, you know, like I could have been, that, that's irresponsible. So, but at the same time, you need to figure out what's going on. Like on Monday, are you too antsy because you didn't trade over the weekend and you're just fired up, ready to go? Maybe you need to include some meditation in there. How do you hone? So like, how do you hone in on the problem that's causing the, the losses without having more losses piled up on top of that? Is it, is it discipline? Is it trading smaller? Like, I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. So how, how would you go about that? So that's the thing. Like, it takes in some investigation and like, I find that just kind of looking at the numbers is the most convincing thing because it's just, it's just fact. And I've had in the past, I've had a friend who was like, Hey, I noticed that on Monday, I just always lose. And I was like, no, it's not, it's not like that. It's completely random. You know, it's just a random distribution. 
Um, but he kept insisting. And so, you know, I've also heard from another friend. He's like, oh man, I hate Mondays. And he's one of the, the best traders I know. And so I was like, okay, well, I have some more free time. I'm going to like investigate this for myself because, <laughs> you know, it, it just seems ridiculous that this idea about Monday and for myself, I view myself as a pretty consistent trader. Like I don't really deviate from my plans and everything like that. And whether I'm sleepy or not, I can still execute fine. Um, so I didn't feel, I didn't think that'd be a problem for me, but when I went and checked, you know, actually like 80% of the drawdown they had this year is from Mondays alone, which I went in and looked at, like, is it because of the way I was trading and everything? No, it's not. It, it literally was, uh, partially just outside factors. I feel like, you know, whatever it is, it's, it could be the new PR sitting the, from the weekend or on the day people were really excited, things like that. Um, those, those things affected the day itself for me. And even though like in prior years it worked because I, I broke it down by year by year and then I did a cumulative. The interesting thing that I found was in 2020 Mondays was were good. And then in 21, I didn't even really make money on Monday. And then in 22, I lost money on Monday and it was the majority of the money I lost. So because I had that much information, I could like kind of plot a trend. And I was like, something is not happening <laughs> correctly on Monday. And whether or not the, you know, that might be the whole market psychology uh, trending towards that direction where like, it's just, it's just stronger, you know, obviously I'm a short seller. So the market might be just stronger in general Monday, but like majority of my PLs came through the midweek and it started taper off on Friday. So I was able to make the decision, like, you know, the way currently as is the way I'm trading Monday is not profitable. I, sh I should just take that day off. However, you know, as in terms of addressing that issue, <clears throat> because I'm recognizing like the broader market needs kind of adjustments. Um, and I'll, I want to circle back to that as well. Um, but because I recognize that I did make some changes, which then I can look back on like the, I can go back and look like what days were really terrible Mondays for me. And I can go and like figure out, okay, with this system or the adjustments that I made, how would it perform now on Mondays? And now it ended up being fine. So then I reintroduced Monday back into my schedule. So it's, I'm not necessarily taking that day off anymore, but like, the fact that I was kind of blind to that while I was trading in real time and I didn't have energy to devote to that kind of like investigation, that really hurt me because uh, I think I'd be a lot happier <laughs> if I didn't trade Mondays. And I was actually like really excited actually when that happened because when I looked at the stat and I was like, you know, it's not even really worth it. I was excited to be like, oh yeah, I can work four days a week. And that, that gives me extra time to be able to, to, you know, do things I enjoy outside of the market and spend time with my wife and things like that. But uh, yeah, you know, I, I do love trading. And so whenever, when I develop a new system, I'm not just gonna be like, oh, I just, I just throw away Mondays because that was the past that that's Mondays on a, on a different set of rules and everything like that. So you, you, you do have to constantly reevaluate, like, what are you doing now? And can you pinpoint days that you either did like really well, but for me, I like to look at the days that look really, that were really bad, like outlier bad days and just see like how I would perform you know, kind of not, it is hindsight in a way, but also, but like with, uh, with your current thoughts and your current ideas about the market, but, uh, with, I'll circle back to the point I was going to make, which is, um, I noticed in the past, you can make quite a bit of reward. So for me, I'm always thinking about trading like risk reward, risk reward. And so being aggressive and like putting on risk was worth it in the past because eventually by being aggressive, you can get like a better kind of average, which is great for a short seller. And you can start building into that position, like through pyramiding or just adding to your position, however you feel like, and that would give you like a good return. And you would see kind of those phases that work out. But what I realized after kind of like the sustained kind of sideways for myself, like I'm not even going, I'm not really going up or down as a trader right now, just straight sideways for months. And, um, what I recognize is that it's because I'm putting on the risk that I should be, but there is no reward. So when I thought to myself, like, what is the way to flip this around is 
it is to take less risk because there's not much reward. So in doing so, I started to think of like, can I have a more like safe style, more safe strategy where I'm more patient, uh, more willing to see confirmation or just like get in much later than I typically would um, in a less aggressive fashion. Because even, even if you say, for example, like come in and you join the backside late, even if you only make a fraction of what you made in the past in terms of like reward, the fact that you didn't take all those paper cuts on the way up, it kind of nets out the same, if not better. So that's kind of like my current adjustment. And I think that that's very, I think that's going to be my rule specific to bear markets, because I think like I mentioned that there's sometimes there's a bearish cycles and bullish cycles. And during those cycles, you know, they don't last too long. And if you trade us, if you trade a consistent way, like you can come out ahead in the end, but in terms of like a straight bear market where it's lasting months, if not years, um, I think that the correct adjustment is to, is just to be a lot more patient and less risk on because like, even though you know, a lot of people, like a lot of short sellers, they found this kind of golden goose and the IPOs that just tank randomly, you know, and they just, they're like, I'm just going to risk a farm on it. Like that was just, that's just not me. And I don't really even see those opportunities often. I don't even know if people find them to be honest, um, besides just maybe scanning for it. But like, I, I wasn't, it never sat right with me. The idea of like betting on just one thing and make, having that make your entire career, like for me, I like to be just really consistent. And so the consistent pattern right now is just that there's not a lot of reward in general. Like that's why you brought up in the last interview, like I saw the same review with Kyle, you know, majority of his month is goes, goes a certain way. And then you, you hit that huge, uh, that huge move. And that's your whole month. Like to me, that's kind of stressful because, um, like, I don't even know if I'll, I'll identify those opportunities. And, and I think with uh, consistent gains and compounding, like you can, you can make a really good, uh, like you can make really good progress for yourself and actually make like a very good income. Not, not even like, uh, I think, I think people think that uh, if, you know, if you risk like a small percentage of your account, you're just making like a paycheck or whatever, but from my experience, like it's actually really good money on a very consistent basis. And I think, I think one of your guests, I'm not sure he mentioned that, uh, because he's risking like a percentage of his account, you know, this is the phenomenon is that when you're doing well, like you're risking more and when you're doing worse, you're risking less. And so like, if all of a sudden I have like this injection of like a massive gain, then I might feel like I need to start risking more in an environment that is still kind of crappy. So I would rather, I would rather keep de-risking over time while it's, while it's, you know, totally terrible and let the consistency of wins prove to me that it's time to put risk on. So it's kind of like, as long as I trade well, the market's going to tell me when to put the risk on. And therefore I'll know when it's time to be consistent and start pulling in my paycheck and stuff like that. Man, that's really, really cool to hear you say that because, um, you know, so you have a background in gaming. I, I have a background in baseball, you know, sports. Gaming is like a sport. So, like, I like to consider, you know, always look at examples of that. And, like, with baseball, I picture, like, the per, the guy that's going for the IPO dump is just, like, the one-dimensional hitter going for the whole, the grand slam home run, to, you know, and then, like, strikes out and, and swings and misses. And, like, he's, he's trying hard for that home run all the time. And, uh the way I trade personally is I, I try to be just consistent and well-rounded and just trade various things and just keep, you know, like, like an income stream, like a really good income stream, you know, it just, um, and having good trades get me in, in the, in a, in like a flow state and just keep going with it. Now, um, you know, so what do you, so like, what, I forgot where I was going with this, but, uh, 
I, I completely blank, blanked out right now. But like, okay, so what would you say to those traders? Like, like, you know, um, to kind of like scale it back a little bit and just keep working on other things as like as because a lot of a lot of newer traders are getting like um enticed by by uh just like seeing one home run trade and just trying to do that with smaller accounts. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like when you see someone win have a two million dollar trade on a on an IPO dump and you're a newer trader with a five ten thousand dollar account how do you even trade that this is, this is a conversation I have a lot um and and oh I know where I was going with the with the consistency thing so like this past week uh people were telling me oh there's VRAX what do you think of v VRAX what do you think of HKD they're gonna dump they're gonna dump these are IPO dumps and I'm like I, that's not for me at least at this stage of my career I'm just trying to build up and just like be consistent and just that's it's 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 it works for me. So like, I, I don't know. I, I, I like trading like that. You know what I'm saying? The way you, you just described, like having being consistent and being just a, a like in baseball, it would be like, um, I like the, I don't know if you, you're familiar with Albert Pujols. He played for the Cardinals and also the Anaheim angels. He was like the top hitter for the first 10 years of his career. He would hit home runs. He was singles, doubles, triples. He will walk a lot. He was a gold glover, uh, fielder he was just well-rounded and like that was like that was like the archetype of uh of a great hitter you know and then you would have like a mark mcguire the home run hitter i don't know if you're familiar with him or you know he would just like swing and miss he would swing so hard he would get like back injuries and like you know when he would strike out and then like he would be out half of his career he was he was injured you know so when i see these these traders going for the the home run all the time i mean you know, in a, in a frustrating market like now, I mean, for, for me, honestly, it hasn't been frustrating, but like I'm a smaller trader. I don't I don't have the amount of capital stacked up from the past couple of years. So like I, I can't trade like that to begin with. But like for the traders that are going sideways and then looking to hit this, you know, they're like, like you said, break even on the year and then they're looking to hit a home run on, on certain stocks and then like missing it's it's a. Uh, it's it's pretty it can get pretty catastrophic you know so i don't know so what so for you do you ever get enticed to to like deviate a little bit or do you just stay the path like uh of what you mentioned i've i've definitely been enticed in the past i've seen you know having such a kind of weird market for myself i've seen times where it's like okay this setup you can actually go big or like I've seen large caps where I'm like, wow, you, you know, you can do whatever you want here. Right. And so I put it on and I think it's like, it, it just doesn't work for me. I, I understand like there are those setups that are really high wood percentage. And I do, I do think it's fine to put like, it's good to put risk on there, but like, you know, just from knowing myself, uh, trying that a lot of times it's just set me back. Like I've, I've tried to go big on like the Pelotons and snap and things like that on days where they're moving. And yeah, it just doesn't, it doesn't connect. And, um, you know, I understand like people will show that it always works, but uh, again, I have, I have a friend who's very successful. He's a number one trader at his firm and on those like IPO dumps and stuff like that, even though he's watching all them, like he, he's not even green on them net. So, you know, that you have to be careful because obviously people are going to share when they're winning and it, it looks amazing, but it is tricky. And if you kind of trade this way, you have to expect a lot of those, you know, emotional pitfalls that come with it. And I think that's just too much because what I've learned as a trader is number one, it's, it's a skill. It's something that you have to be consistent with. It's something you have to see yourself doing, you know, for a long time. And it, as a smaller trader, what I would say is that it's not really important for you to build your bankroll um, right away because it it will happen rather quickly. Like the story of a lot of these traders that people look up to, we're seeing them now, you know, in their later stages, but their early beginning phases, they're all very similar. They, they're all just learning their thing. They're being consistent. And then they hit that like third year or whatever. And because of the work they put in, they can scale exponentially and it just happens really quickly like when once you've developed that consistent skill that you're confident in, you can you can scale it up to the point where i feel like even 
this year in January, um, I had a thought in the back of my mind. I was like, I could just retire now. Uh, I could, I mean, not, not forever as a trader, but I could just not stop trading this year basically. And I was thinking like at, at some point as a trader, uh, trading becomes somewhat, it's like a game, right? And it's less about the money because as traders, we have the ability to say, okay, I've made enough money where I don't have to work for the next couple, like the next couple of months, next year, next couple of years. And eventually if you keep that up, you can say, oh, I can just retire. So for me, I think trading is not really necessarily about the money and people who get good don't always think about the money. Like majority of them don't. Some do, yes. Some want the money more than anything. But for a lot of us who trade consistently well, the rewards kind of show up. Like I was able to make investments that will pay out for the next eight years, um, you know, more than people is like, more money than people need. And so for me, like right now, trading is just a game. And, you know, I've done the things that I wanted to do. Like I, you know, naively thought like, oh, I want to make a bunch of money so I can buy something really expensive or I can do something really luxury. And like, what I find is that, you know, the money doesn't even really buy you happiness. Um, what I would have rather done actually, and if I ever like have a year like 2020, 2021 again, is I would rather just go out and make an impact on people, like give someone a fat tip or make, like help someone who where that money actually makes a big impact versus like, as this trader, you're making so much money that like, you don't even blink bat an eye when you lose, you know, like a fat stack. And it just, I don't think it needs to be rushed. And at the same time, I've, I've been in contact with like, I, I've met traders who like they had a really big ego and they thought they were super good. And like, um, I'm trying to be careful because I don't want to like out this person, but basically like they came up to me and they asked me like, you know, how much you make and stuff like that? Cause he, he was kind of drunk. And, um, I was like, oh, this much. And he's like, oh, okay. Cause he was, he was coming up and he was trying to think that he was like super hot shit. And he worked for a firm and like we discussed it and he was like, yeah, I give like a 50% of it or whatever back. So he's like, I respect you as a retail trader because, you know, like, you know, you don't have the backing and stuff like that. And like, I feel that, you know, and I should mention like these traders feel that they have to go like massive on trades. Right. So I think this, this, the cold hard reality is that like being consistent can outperform even those traders who say like, oh, you have to go really massive. And then on the flip side, even if you're like someone like Ducks, who just makes a, a boatload on one trade, like you think, do you think at this point, a couple hundred grand makes a difference to him? Like, I don't think he even really cares if, if it doesn't change the way he lives, it doesn't change his life. Uh, he's, he's doing it for fun and it's cool because you get to see yourself growing and stuff like that. But at the same time, there's also kind of like a diminishing return to everything. And especially in small caps, like there's a, there is a limit unless, on, unless it's a certain day where it's like highly liquid, where how much capital you really can put on depending on your style. And so like, you have to ask yourself, like, what is your goal with trading? And for me, like, I want to be able to trade um, in a, I, I mean, it's stressful, but I want to be able to trade where it's consistent. I'm, I'm doing it mostly because I like to do it. And I don't want to feel like my uh, value is attached, like value as a person is attached to my PL. And I don't want to feel like I'm owned by this job. And I feel like the trajectory I was going, if, if life kept continuing, like the last two years, I felt like I would have burned out really, really quickly. And a lot of times I will say that if I was doing the same thing, I was doing like, just trading like a madman every single day. If I was doing that for the next couple of years, I would have not uh, really enjoyed it because I was like losing sleep. I went to the doctor and he's like, you have, you have like almost hypertension, which I, thankfully I got that down now, but he was saying, you know, you have high blood pressure. Uh, I had like a bunch of like issues health-wise that I wasn't able to take care of because I kept putting it off. Like got to trade, got to trade. And so 
there's like that's like the sick reality is like i remember looking i i saw a tweet i don't know if, i don't know if this is true but it was like the guy who created elliot wave theory like he died broke right and this and then he said uh you know people brought up like jesse livermore like you know he committed suicide things like that like the money is not everything and it and while you need it yes it's it's going to be important but the, the truth is like making money in the market is so unlike anything else like it, it's not like a job where you can only have a certain income cap um you'll if you master the skill in a consistent way, you will have more than enough money to take care of your needs and take care of everybody. And like, I often think of what's the point of uh, some people, they want like generational wealth, but I think, you know, um, I grew up uh, somewhat privileged. Like I I think we were like upper middle class, I think. Um, I feel like you don't want to give your kid like a bunch of money. Uh, like a trust fund kid because they're just gonna they're not gonna know how to navigate life in a healthy way and you don't know if you're robbing them of something which is hard work so like what's the point uh, in my opinion of like doing all the things I, I would rather enjoy life make an impact on people now and um just be like generally happy and i think that there are so many traders who like put out this like you know grind set hustle and everything like that but even look at from a lot of the trader, like really top traders I've talked to and interacted with, like a lot of them end up slowing down. Some people go completely dark on like their social media. Like I, I know a guy who like, he made a ton of money and he like just deleted, he nuked his feed. He, he had a blog, he nuked his blog. It's nowhere to be found anymore. Um, he just doesn't want anything to do with that anymore. And like, you know, their personal journey, like their quest is like, how do I be happy? How do I have the, find this balance? Because like when you're going to be like an elite trader or whatever, you end up making so many sacrifices and you don't realize until one day where you're just like, whoa, this, when things go bad all of a sudden, you're like, who the, who am I? I don't even know what I like to do. Um, they're like lost, you know, they're like, why doesn't this make me happy or stuff like that? And I think that's kind of sad. And uh, I don't, I don't really want to go down that route, especially being like knowing that how much money traders can make versus the rest of the world. There's like a massive disparity there. So, um, you know, in short, like I like to ramble, but like, like money is not everything you'll, you'll find that out eventually. Uh, if you're new, you know, it is a skill that takes years of work, at least, you know, three years at least if you're just putting every single hour you have into it possible um so you have to really look at yourself on this you have to put you have to place yourself on this timeline of like okay what are the expectations i should have for myself in year one it's like it no it's not betting your whole account and doubling your bankroll because you know you you might not even know what to do with that and you you could you could lose that as easily as it came you know the the faster you get it, the easier it is to lose, right? So it's like by being consistent and re- recognizing why, um, why that narrative of like going all in and things like that is could be wrong, or well, could be wrong for you. Um, realizing that might be more powerful for your journey, and uh, you know, I honestly wish, like, sometimes I wish that. I could tell, I could outright be like, oh, this is how much I made and stuff like that, being consistent and like risking a certain percentage. Because it would be like proof to people who want it, who want that validation of like how they feel internally that being consistent works. Um, however, you know, like I have, I want to be discreet, especially because people from my real life know about my trading. And I don't want that to influence my relationships. So, I have to, I do keep that to myself and I, and I don't want to figure, I don't want to find out uh, how people treat you when, you know, you are a certain way. Uh, I want people to treat me normally. So for that reason, like I can't share it, but yeah, it's like, it's a lot. Like I literally felt like I could have just retired for a very long time. I could have retired in January. I wouldn't have bad an eye if I quit trading for a couple of years. So 
that's what trading consistent can do for you. And it's, it's really not that stressful. Um, well, I mean, trading is all stressful, but it's like, it's a lot less stressful. Like I literally look at a trade, like, oh, it's just a, it's just a probability. I don't, I don't really feel like it's going to go one way or the other. And my job is mostly execution. So it's like, in that way, it becomes more of like a, like a technical sport where it's less about, it's less about the result and more about how you come to that result. So I'm really like, I'm, I feel these days, I feel the happiest when I can be in the flow, you know, when I'm in the flow state of like, okay, I know, I know exactly what button to press. I'm trading like five to eight tickers at the same time. Like I'm managing the risk perfectly. All my, you know, I know what size to be in. I know how much I'm going to lose on those trades. I know where I'm going to get in, where I'm going to get out. Like that to me, that's where I feel like the most fulfilled as a trader when I'm like executing on a high level, not when I have big days, there's a lot of days where I had a big day and I'm like, Oh, whatever, you know, like, and, and those days just glaze over you. And like having had a kind of like a sideways, uh, year, um, there were days where I lost like a ton of money, um, relative, uh, well, it's within my plan, but like, because the numbers go high, you know, it's like you lose a ton of money and you're like, I don't even think about it. Like it, it doesn't even matter to me. So that's the thing. Like it, it will just, you will just become numb to it. So I, I caution people for like wanting to rush their way there and really consider like the part that no one wants to hear, which is, you know, a lot of great traders can also not be happy too. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's 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 uh, incredible to hear you you mention all that. It's like I know it's like uh, they say after seventy thousand dollars, seventy thousand dollars is like covers all your li to live comfortably. So more than that, your life doesn't really exponentially change. Uh, you know, so like after a certain point, I guess you know what I'm trying to say. After a certain point, the money doesn't matter. You know, um, it's more like a game, like a sport. Uh, you know, you're just, it's, it's, you know, you know what I'm saying? It seems like you've gotten to that level and, um, and you know, you, you're just like, it's, it's not about the money. And like, it's interesting to hear you say that, you know, you, you keep it like to yourself because you don't want your, your life to be affected by people knowing that, you know, less, that you're making this much money or whatever, and people treat you differently. So has that always been the case? Uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty discreet with it. Cause it's like, I really don't think that anyone besides a trader can relate. Like it's, it's impossible to say, you know, if, yeah. if you tell someone, if you tell someone, Oh, this is how much I made or this is how much I lost. They're, they're always going to be surprised. So it, it's just, uh, it's not worth it to speak to. Yeah. Yeah. I totally understand with that. Um, in fact, when I was at trade space in Puerto Rico, I was there for all of last year. Um, that's why Lucci saying Lucci, he created the, the trade space. He's like, so traders can relate to each other. Cause like, it's hard, um, to talk about trading or the amount of money you're making outside of the trading, you know, outside of your trading buddies or whatever, like, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's, it's hard to relate. Like I know for me, um, I come from an architecture background. I can't, I don't even know uh, the few conversations I've had with my former colleagues. It's hard to fathom. Uh, okay, I made this much money today, but they make that like in a month, you know, so it's it's just it's just hard to relate. So it's very interesting to get all your thoughts on that, man. These are very deep thoughts. You know, that's why I've, I've always liked to hear all the stuff that you've, you've put out in the past. Very thoughtful, very, you know, um, approach to trading and, and just overall in general, like the mentality it takes to to be a good trader. And, I, you know, I think that it had that itself has to do with a lot of the reason why you were successful i'm guessing i don't know why you were successful in gaming at that level you were doing it at um because you have that mentality and i think when you when you talk the way you do for the past you know this podcast i think a lot of especially newer intermediate traders everybody advance everybody can can get an insight on how how you think how that mentality is to be uh, a high level trader you know and to have, you know what I mean? So thanks, thanks, Brian, for 
giving the time for the podcast and for like um going in depth the way you did man it's, it's really cool i really appreciate it i'm sure a lot of people will get a lot of value from 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 this episode appreciate that thank you thanks for having me on thanks brian you have a great rest of your weekend